Praise God. Good morning, church. It's always an exciting time of the year for me when we come to do Vision Sunday because God is busy laying out the plan for the next year and the next season. <clears throat> One thing I know about vision is that, um, you know, people say to me, well, we, did, we didn't get to do, we didn't see that happen or that happened last year. So it's not the failure of vision, it's the failure of participation. And uh, very often people want to sit back and wait God to do it, but God gives us the picture and requires us to paint it. Are you seeing that? God gives us the picture, but He requires us to paint it. He requires us to build it. And if we're not building it and we don't see it coming, it's not because God didn't speak. It's because we failed in becoming a producer and became a consumer. And so that's what the prophetic word has been saying to us this morning. You know, sometimes we allow our past to hold us captive. Anyway, it's really exciting for me always to come and to share vision with you. And especially this, this year again, um, God is sharing and God is building on that which is, He established last year. And last year was reset. You know, it was a year of resetting and God was establishing that. And we, we've gone back to the, the, the aspects of our roots, spirit and word and the move of the spirit because that is vital. You know, and, um, and I'm excited about this year, about the word momentum that God has got for us. At the end of the service, you will be getting a little book, the booklet of, uh, of the thing. I, we don't hand it out before it's because people start reading it and don't listen to what I have to say. <laughs> and what I have to say is important. Amen. So it's really exciting. But in it, in it you will read because I won't be covering that in the vision and I want you to read it because I don't know if many people actually read what we put inside here. It's all the prophetic words that have come over this year. And um, the amazing things, you know, Brother Copeland, Brother Jezebel, Brian Gurian, Patricia, King, Graham Cook, they're all saying the same thing. And you've got, to need, you've got to understand something, you know, sometimes we, we think that last year, you know, people say, wow, you know, last year was a really tough year, and this happened, and that happened. I want you to understand, you know, when, when, when I was at the Kenneth Copeland conference, now just recently, what was happening to us was happening globally. There is an onslaught in the church to quiet the voice. You've got to understand that the enemy goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He doesn't seek to devour people out there. He already has them under his control. He seeks to devour them in the church because he doesn't have you under their control. And the way that he devours you is by what you say because he operates on the words that speak you speak. And when he begins to function, that's when he brings accusation against you. And that's when you begin to break down. He begins to uh, create hurt and create all kinds of stuff and begins to break down the effectiveness of the body of Christ. Are you out there? Yeah. And so it's key that we understand is that I always say to people, be very careful that you zip your lip because the enemy is going around and the only way he has authority is by the disgruntled words that come out of your mouth. And that's when he brings accusation, he brings division, he brings strife, he brings everything else. And then suddenly, you know, people are now church hopping and they're doing one thing and some are not even going to church. They become disillusioned. Amen. And we've heard, I mean, last year, last year, tragic, one of the pastors in one of the churches in America, churches in California committed suicide. Not one, there were many, but we only read about the ones that are prominent. Why? Because the enemy is seeking to quiet and still the voice that God is wanting to speak in this time in this nation. You need to understand, I'm just, I'm just going with the Spirit this morning, you need to understand that there is an agenda, a secular agenda, a, a demonic agenda that is trying to quiet the church. And more and more, the, 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 the aspects of the LGB and the political correct and everything else is coming against the church, even to this point that they're busy trying to sign a bill in California to ban the Bible from California. And, you know, the Americans are up in arms because that's our First Amendment rights. Are you with me? But you, you, you think, well, they'll never get it right. Well, how come New Yorkers now can murder babies and outside of the womb? And we thought that would never happen. A, a man that is caught in prison, who is lying in prison for a capital punishment, they, they, the, the legislation says he shouldn't be you know, injected uh, because of his crime, but we quite happily, for an innocent baby, we can take them out. Do you understand where we are as a church? And God is requiring of us to take and step up higher to the plan 
and purposes that He's ordained for our life. And momentum is about the great harvest. That's the only way we're going to change people's mentality is by being more proactive about the things we believe. Listen to me. You've you got to understand something, and, and, and I'll get into the vision now. You've got to understand something. There is an agenda to dumb down education. Because if I can dumb down education, and I touch a little bit on the vision. If I can dumb down education, and how do I dumb down? Because I asked a, a lady in America recently, and she's, a, she's studying her master's on education. I said, do you understand? Do you know how to dumb down education? She said, no, I don't know. I said, it's very simple. You remove the moral absolutes or integrity of God out of the system. Then you operate on relative truth. And relative truth then can become anything that a governing body or voices now declare is truth. Are you, listen to me. That's how you dumb down education. It's not about reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's about the moral values and the moral integrity that we are supposed to hold and live by and raise our children with. Are you with me? And, and it started with the whole evolution thing coming in. And so slowly but surely, because if they can remove the Bible out of education, they then can control you. And, and by the way, they're busy legislating to control you as a parent, how to raise your children, how children can now have the right to choose their genders, and how parents can be persecuted and prosecuted. You've got to understand there is an agenda, and the, and the enemy wants to silence the church. So what we went through over these last, this last year is not unique to us. It's unique globally. And sometimes people get, oh, and they, they fall all over the place. If you go and understand what is happening globally to the church, you will understand the onslaught that has come against us to silence the voice of God. Because the only voice people will hear is your voice when you speak the solution to people's problems, not the problem that you're going through. Right. Yeah. Come on. Amen? And so I just want to encourage you with that this morning, that it's key that we understand that God is bringing about this momentum for this next season. And we need to participate. We can't just sit back. And I will talk about how we can contend for vision this morning, how we can contend for momentum. I just want to welcome all the online viewers if you've come in and to join us this morning. God bless you. Uh, we trust that you will be impacted with the, the, the vision that God has not only for Carmel but it's for people out at large and if you part of this church will welcome. We understand that this morning the weather's a lot better. People are not slipping and sliding into church uh, but they're able to walk up right into church so that's really good. Last week we had a lot of snow and a lot of ice. Anyway, welcome. And so Father, we love you. We are grateful this morning once again that we can gather in your name, in the name of your Son, that, Father, that you will speak to us. And once again, Lord, that you give us the vision, the understanding, the plans, the purposes that you've ordained, that together we can see your kingdom come and your will be done. Father, we understand our responsibility as children of the Most High God, as royal priesthoods, that, Father, that we uphold the absolutes of your moral values and integrity in a nation and a, and a society that is totally anti us. Today, again, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will bypass the hearing of the ear and penetrate the heart of the hearer so that together we may come and stand united for the plans that you have ordained. For you said, Lord, where we, the brethren, dwell together in unity, there you command the blessing. And so we pray the blessing upon this house in Jesus' name because we are united with one purpose and that is the vision of God that you have given us for this time, this season, in Jesus' name. Amen. It was in October last year, in October last year, that God gave me the word momentum. You can start firing up the, the PowerPoint. Gave me the word momentum. And as I was busy preparing this, God showed me that this year is going to be a year of breaking barriers. You need to understand. And I love the prophetic, the, the one of the prophetic words that came up was that people are bound. You know, and it just immediately what fired up was the story of Lazarus. Lazarus, Jesus said, uh, loose him and let him go. You know, when, when we raised Lazarus from the dead, he then said, loose him and let him go. In other words, it's our responsibility to help people unwrap 
the junk and the accusations that the enemy has tried to put on them. And we are the instrument that God uses to loose him and let him go. And so it's really exciting that this year is going to be about breaking the barriers, the momentum to break the barriers together. So the meaning of momentum, the, the, Bible, the Webster's Dictionary defines momentum as the strength or force that something, something has when it is moving. Um, The strength or force that allows something to continue to grow stronger, I love this, or faster as time passes. Amen. My wife is sending messages to, and it's busy popping up on my PowerPoint display here. Could you just stop now? Can Can you exclude me from your group of messages? And I keep going up like this. Just take me out of the conversation. (laughs) So, mass times velocity equals momentum. Momentum plus purpose creates impact. And that's what I call, I call that the MPI. What is our MPI? God has given us momentum and we have a purpose and that creates the impact. We'll see that momentum plus Purpose creates impact. Your faith is a force when it's moving towards the vision that God has given you, turning a dream from fantasy into reality. For Carmel, the vision is equipping people that we aim our faith at to make an impact on our community. And these are key. Here's another thing. Uh, If you look at Luke 9 verse 2, it says, He sent them to preach. That's the momentum. He sent them. There is a going. There is a requisition. That's why I say we can't just be consumers. We need to be participators. He sent them to preach. Um, the, what are we preaching? The purpose. The kingdom of God. You see, there's a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is a place, but the kingdom of God is a culture. And we are there to preach the kingdom of God's culture. And he says, and to heal the sick. That's the impact. When we begin to see people being healed from sickness of relationship, of uh, diseases in their body, of financial sickness, whatever the sickness may be. Because very often, we're only thinking of, on the aspects of illness. But there can be illness in every facet. In people's mentality, the way we sit and think, and the way we believe. That can also hold us captive, and we can walk into those places that, or uh, walk into the place that holds us, uh, causes us to be sick. The word that God gave me for this year is momentum with God equals victory. And and Psalm 18 verse 29 in the Passion reads, With you as my strength I can crush an enemy horde, advancing through every stronghold, I love that, that stands in front of me. What a God you are. Your path for me has been perfect. All your promises have proven true. What a secure shelter for all those who turn to hide themselves in you. You are the wraparound God giving grace to me. Isn't that an awesome scripture? But what I love is that you are my strength and I can crush an enemy horde advancing through every stronghold that stands in front of me. And that's the breaking barriers for us this year. Breaking down the strongholds, those things that have been trying to cause us or to resist us from moving forward in the plan and purposes of God. God has called this ministry to a global, um, a, a global manifestation or a global effectiveness. And we've seen that. We've seen many that have gone out. But to be more specific and more focused on bringing about that global picture is so much important or so very important. So here's the thing is that we must contend for momentum. You know, two weeks ago I preached this message in Houston, and if you do go on our church app, you'll find it there, and you can look at it in more detail. But I'll give you some of the highlights. The first thing that we need to understand is that um, the enemy wants us to compromise. You know, let me, let me say this to you. It, it takes a five-foot thick wall with reinforcing to stop a train when it's traveling at 50 miles an hour. But do you know if you just put a little one-inch block at its wheel before it starts up, it won't move forward. And that's very much like our faith. There comes the little things that begin to distract us. The Bible says the little foxes spoil the vine. He says those little things that become to distract us and cause us to move away. And God began to show me three things. You know, if you, if you look in, into, into Joshua, not Joshua, into, yeah, Joshua 13, I think it is. Let me just quickly go there. 
Joshua 13. He says, Now Joshua was old, verse 1, and well advanced in years. And the Lord had said to him, You are old and advanced in years, but very much land still remains to be possessed. He says, This land that remains, all the districts of the Philistines and those of the Gersherites, from Shechor, east of Egypt, towards whatever. And he says, And there are five Philistine governors, Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron, and all the Avites' land also remaining. So what happened is when God told them, he says, when you're going into the promised land, he says, don't make agreements with anybody. And what happened is they made agreements. They compromised. And when they began to compromise, these five Philistine uh, uh, kings have come against, and they were continually a thorn in the side of uh, the Israelites' um, uh, journey and destiny to, uh, to completely en encompass all that God has for them. And so it is interesting to note that if you look at the, the, the aspects of this, these stories, and you can go look them up for yourself, that the first thing, by losing focus, in other words, when we don't keep our eye on the vision, Samson lost focus through uncontrolled passion, which cost him his eyes. Are you with me? In other words, instead of focusing on the things of God, he began to focus on the passion of his own life. He began to look at, well, you know, and when we make church about ourselves and about what we want and not about what God wants, we lose focus. And in losing focus, the enemy will come and he will take our eyes where we will no longer be able to see the plan and purposes of God. And that's what happened to Samson. Samson uh, he was distracted by Delilah. He didn't control his flesh. And immediately he lost that aspect of focus. Um, the second one is by doubting. One of the things. And yes, the, in the interesting thing about focus is, is, is it was in, in Gaza, one of the cities of the Philistine kings, that Samson lost his eyesight. In Gath, we see the second one in Gath. He says, by doubting our faith, Goliath intimidated the Israelites' faith and caused them to walk in fear. Why? He came from Gath. He was one of the giants from Gath. Isn't it interesting that when you begin to compromise, these things come against you? And so immediately they began to doubt their faith. So the enemy is not out, out for you, only your focus. He's also out for your faith. He wants to stimulate your life into a position of fear, that you make fearful decision or fearful decisions instead of making decisions based upon your faith. This ministry has always been about faith. If we begin to operate now on the basis of fear, we're doomed. Amen? And so often it's because we see this, the, the onslaught of the enemy. And by the way, it's not just unique to us. It's unique to the churches around the world. And if we begin to see that, and that's what happened to the Presbyterian Church in America. The onslaught came and they began to back away and became politically correct. That today you cannot tell the difference between them and the world. Because they believe the same, they marry the same, they live the same. Are you out there? And so just because we're going through a difficult time or have been, and I believe our breakthrough is coming, we're breaking barriers. Because we have gone through those times, immediately we want to make decisions based upon our past instead of making decisions based upon our future. That's what the Spirit of God was saying this morning. You don't make decisions based upon the things of your history. You make the decisions based upon the revelation of the prophetic utterance or the word that God has given you. Then... <clears throat> And then God requires you to step out in faith, not in fear. And we become fearful. Come on. Come on. You know, and people are captivated by fear. People, you know, people say, oh, I fear a dog. Why do you fear a dog? Well, when I was a kid, the dog bit me. Yeah, but you're bigger than the dog. So why do you say, and the smallest dog can come out. And in the minute they, they're running down the street. Why? Because they've allowed their history and their experience to dominate their present condition and how they're going to navigate into their future. And so this is what happened as they stood there. They've been conquering the land. Goliath comes out. He's big and he's intimidating them and they move in fear. And the Bible says they were all captivated by fear. But thank God there's a David. There is a David that operates in faith. There was a David that opened his mouth and said, Today I removed that Philistine's head. Why did he remove his head? He wanted to shut him up forever. That mouth that speaks, that brings accusation. Come on, man. I'm preaching good this morning. You need to engage a little bit more. The third one we see is breaking fellowship. 
running with false fire when we make worship of church about us and not about him. This is an amazing story, and you can go and read the, the David and Goliath. This, this third one is Eli. How many of you know the story of Eli? Eli did not discipline his children. He was captivated by his emotional uh, 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 connection to them to the point that when you begin to compromise, you then begin to compromise the presence of God. What happened is eventually they went and fought against the Philistines and they lost the battle and they lost the Ark of the Covenant. They lost, uh, they lost the, the very presence of God. Are you with me? And so when you begin to compromise and when you begin to look at these things and, and break fellowship with God based upon emotional, people make emotional decisions. Let me tell you, guys, we, we're fighting for the next generation of children. Yes. Momentum is about our children. And if we're not, if we are making decisions emotionally about them, oh, Daddy, I don't like that church. My kids never had an option. You come into church if you like it or not. As long as you're under my roof and you eat my food, you will come and worship my God. You could have been a little bit more. Yeah. And it was true. I mean, they tried to smuggle every kind of comic into, into church in the middle of their Bible, and I would expose it every time. Why? Because I wanted them to have a meaningful encounter with God. When they were sick, and, and Daddy, I've got a stomach. I said, well, that's when you need church. We're going to church because in church, the pastor can pray for you and you can get healed. And it's amazing. When it came time for the healing line, they were all healed. Are you with me? And so that's how we break fellowship when we are emotionally moved, when we know to do the right thing. And the Word of God dictates to us the right thing. And then Eli, you know, the Bible says that in the days of Eli, prophetic utterances were just, they couldn't hear. It had to take a little boy, Samuel, to come and speak to Eli about the future of him and his family and think, you know, one thing I'm not going to allow, I'm not going to allow the emotional dictates of family or anything to dictate the vision and the purpose and the plans of God. You need to understand that. I'm here for the long journey. I want to stand one day before the Father, and he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Here is a crown of righteousness. Not a crown of doing, uh, you know, building amazing ministry, but doing the right thing. And because Eli failed to bring that correction, they fell out of fellowship with God and they made worship about themselves. Today, churches are making worship about entertaining people instead of entertaining the very power and the presence of God. That is our responsibility, church. You need to understand it. Don't allow things emotional to captivate you. Pastor M said to this morning, he says, when you put your hands to the plow and you're busy plowing, don't look back. He says, you're not fit for the kingdom of God, but keep plowing forward. Uh, you know, and this is not a hard word. This is a caution for us. Momentum, to create momentum, three things we've got to fight for. We've got to fight for our vision, our focus, our faith, not allow fear to captivate us, and our fellowship and our obedience to the word of God. Can I have an amen? amen. Let's move on. So the importance of vision, when there's no clear prophetic vision, people quickly wander astray. But when you follow the revelation of the word, heaven's bliss, it fills your soul. It's so powerful. I love the, the passion I've been, as you can see, I've been reading it quite a bit. And uh, in the message it says, if people can't see what God is doing, let me tell you, God is doing something in this house this morning. The fact that you are here, the fact that this building operation is coming to a completion very soon, that's going to create such traffic in and out of this place, that's going to make this, and they're going to, I believe the park and ride is going to be removed, and they're building something like, how many? Hundred and something houses, plenty houses. We, the church, are slacked back right in the middle of what everything that is happening in this community. Look at the strategy of God. Look at how God purposes and plans for us and brings us to be a lighthouse. He said this church will always be a lighthouse. Many have tried to extinguish this light in this house. But I thank God that I serve a God that is greater than any man and any human experience. And that He stands firm and He will stand over His word to perform it. Irrespective of people's agreement or disagreement. Amen. 
So if people can't, can't see what God is doing, they stumble over themselves. But when they attend to Him, He reveals and they are most blessed. I want you to know, we are a most blessed church. So vision takes the wisdom to build a house. Vision is the blueprint for prosperity. It, wisdom to build a house and understanding to set it on a firm foundation. It takes knowledge to furnish it. It's rooms with fine furniture and beautiful draperies. Any enterprise is built by wise planning becomes strong through common sense and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. Now, you might say, well, you know, we, you, you say that every year. Yes. Why? Faith comes by and and amen. So faith comes. You see, the vision is the word of God. I'll try that again this side. That side just went quiet. The vision is the word of God. It's a prophetic revelation. It's not asking for your permission. It's asking for your participation. Amen. The vision is the word of God. God will stand over his word to perform it. And I love that. So the purpose of our vision is, are we keeping up? To affect spiritual change through evangelism, pastoral care, discipleship, and missional assignment. To establish households that can be practically and spiritually benefit a community through its care project and programs. To demonstrate the presence of God in a tangible way to all who are searching for an authentic encounter with God. Not some flim-flam encounter with God, but an authentic encounter with God. So the aims and objectives of our charity, because you've got to understand that the charity we operate under a legal body called a charity, is to advance the Christian faith in accordance with the statement of beliefs in such parts of the UK and the world. The promotion of the Christian faith through education and training of life skills, child care, and relational reconciliation. I love that. Relational reconciliation. Our ministry is recon. Mm -hmm. And then number three, the alleviation of poverty within the community and addressing its needs. So vision requires your participation. Wisdom can make anyone into a mighty warrior and revelation knowledge increase strength. Wise strategy is necessary to wage war and with many astute advisors. And I thank God we got many astute advisors. You will see the path to victory more clearly. A wise man is mightier than a strong man. Wisdom is mightier than strength. Don't go to war without wise guidance. There is safety in many counselors. And one of the things, you know, whenever I bring, I bring vision, I bring it before uh, the overseers and I bring it before those that, uh, that and, and I listen to what the body of Christ is saying and then measure it in that and then begin to apply the principles and ask for that participation for people to add. So vision dictates strategy and process, and the Lord answered me. He says, write the vision down and make it plain on tablets that he who reads it may run. This is why we do the little vision booklet, that he who reads it may run. That's why you know, and that's how, you know, how people build houses. People have a blueprint, and on that blueprint, they then follow the plan of the blueprint, and that's how we get these amazing buildings. And he says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but it speaks of an end. And does not lie. If it delays, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And so again, we will see the fulfillment of God, what God is doing. So vision has strategy, and it has process. And Pastor M touched on it very briefly. It is to uh, cover our city, bless our neighbor, send to the nation, and touch the world. That is the strategy that God gave us right in the early days, and it hasn't changed, and it's still the same. And we do that through the disciple process called share, care, prepare, and dare. And that is how we, we, we share the love of God with people. We care for them. We equip them. And then we encourage them to step out and share that faith with others. And again, for following the same process and plans and purposes. So, a time to reflect. Our past does not define who we are, but what we can learn from it. So the key is always, what can I learn from this experience? So we have had, um, we have had 24,674 people through our doors for conferences and services for the past year. Isn't that amazing that through these doors, 24,674 people came through. That's the impact we get. Well, you say, well, I come 52 weeks. Yes, but you don't come 2,000 weeks. 
or you didn't come 2,000 times. You may have come 50 times. You know, well, I attend service every Sunday. So we count, yeah, we count every time your body comes through the door. The same way as that Dawn has attended to 2,503 children. That's why she needs a lot of prayer and she needs a lot of help. Amen. We really want to see our, Christians, our, our children's church flourish. Do you understand? They're doing an amazing work. They're preparing them for the next phase of their life, and that needs to come into the main service. Amen. And so we saw 1,637 attending St. Revolution and 96 delegates and 19 workers on youth camp. This is this past year. Now, we're believing to double those figures all around. We want to see that those figures double. We want to create uh, an environment, and this is where I'm going to ask parents to participate in the vision. Because it's up to you to see. Listen, if your children wander away from God, it's not because the church failed. I'll try that again. It's not because the church failed. Well, they didn't put enough programs on. No, it's because you did not encourage them for an encounter with God. And sometimes it's going to require of you not to have your Friday night to yourself, but to get off your tush. Oh. Hello? Hey, man. I participated with my kids. You know, sometimes, you know, they, they didn't like too much the dad. You know, they're all serving God today. They might be serving Him in different places, but they're serving God. The key is they're serving God. Did I, did I fulfill my mission and my mandate? Absolutely. Ah, happy birthday. You're out there. Hmm. It says our school has 44 attending classes daily. So daily. So if you took 44 and you multiplied it by five days and you multiplied by the number of weeks, you can see how many times the doors, people come through our door. Now, I want you to just catch something. Every time somebody comes through the door, there's a toilet that's being flushed. There's toilet paper that's being used. There's electricity that's being switched on. There is a seat that's being sat on. Amen. Amen. So we still have 31 places available, but we really want to push in the early years for this, next, for this next season. Why the early years? Because the early years is the feeder into our Christian school. And from the Christian school, it's a feeder into our Bible school. Why? Because we're equipping people for life. You need to understand it. It's not just another program we put on. You know, people do 12 years of study to go to school to learn to read, write, and do arithmetic. They spend seven years or eight years to learn to do a career, but they spend no time to learn how to do life and navigate life. And the best place to learn and navigate life is through Christian education and the Bible school, because the Bible school will tell you how to navigate life. If you've never done Bible school, may I encourage you, come, sacrifice a Friday night and a Saturday for a number of weeks and come and be equipped. Come and learn. If there are problems in your life, if there are crises in your life, you need to ask yourself the question, where in my equipping has something fallen, uh, fallen away? You know, when, when I got to understand what it means to be a man in 1983 and then began to follow the curriculum, the Maximized Manhood curriculum, it changed my life forever. But it took an effort on a Saturday morning to get off, out of my bed early in the morning, go make breakfast and go and prepare men for life. And then we started the mentoring group. You know, people, some people say, oh, this is too much trouble. Well, then suffer in your circumstances if you're not prepared to invest in yourself. Period. Amen. If the person's next to you sleeping, just give them a little nudge and say, it's time to wake up and smell the roses. Hello. Because I can see some people have the minute I began to talk, switch off. Our chaplaincy team, listen to this, our chaplaincy team under Pastor Ken and Julia Turner visit seven care homes and minister to more than 450 people on a weekly basis. There are two new homes pending, so they could do with help. You know what? What a better way to reach those people who are about to launch into eternity with the gospel and the good news that you don't have to miss it. You can make it. Amen? Petra at the prison ministry. Are you way ahead of me, sweetie? Petra and the prison ministry saw over 150 salvations. We visited four prisons 33 times this year and gave out uh, more than... 400 gifts to inmates. I've also got the thing. We've given out on the streets 4,005 
uh, leaflets or tracts to people. And they didn't just osmos. We printed them, folded them, cut them, and took them into the streets. So if as a church, sometimes people think church is just about Sunday and forget about all the other activity that is taking place in this building during, during the week and how much effect we are bringing into our community and our city. And God wants us to see us doubling that. It says, we have fed and ministered to over 2,162 people with a soup run team on, on uh, this year, on every Tuesday. We go out every Tuesday. I believe it's every Tuesday, I'm right? Every Tuesday. We've been doing this for more than 20 years. One of the things about Carmel is that we never miss a Tuesday run. Of all the people, you go out and you talk to some of the homeless people on the streets, and they say, we can set our clocks by Carmel. They are always there. And so I want you to know, those contributions, those sandwiches, those things that we make, is all to impact people with the good news of the gospel, that Jesus loves them, and that they don't have to stay in that situation. The beauty is that the numbers of homeless have been reduced in our city. So there is an effective pro way that we're enabling and helping people find their plans and purposes for their life. Amen. The Hamper Project saw uh, the church prepare 1,700, that's the most hampers we've ever prepared, and fed approximately 4,950 people. And so it's really important. Our present situation does not have the power to control us, only if we give in to it. Do you understand? And so the restructure of our leadership model is working well and is allowing the team to operate on a greater level of creativity and autonomy, because that is the desire that God wanted to see. Never to be, you know, but the Jerry controls everything. Uh, listen, I have a hard time controlling me. <laughs> I have no desire to control anybody. Uh, it's just too much like hard work. Hey, man, if I can't even control my wife, I'm in big trouble. I mean, I've been <laughs> trying that for 43 years, and I've not been able to control her. I'm s as you can see, text messages flying on my presentation while I'm trying to concentrate. Amen. So it's great because the vision has been established. Do you understand? It's, it's not, we don't have to create new vision. The vision has been established. We know what our responsibilities are. We're an equipping center. We're equipping people to do life. So the restructure, and that's good. We are still believing for someone for the position of equipping overseer. I'm temporarily managing that, but we trust in God. God is going to bring the right person at the right time to fill that position. We're not in a hurry. We want to do and find the person anointed for that place. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? And so let us look back. There's a quick little video that they prepared about. It's going to take about five minutes or so or three minutes, whatever. Just looking at some of the highlights of last year before I go into our future purposes.
Amen. Amen. There have been an awesome year last year. And, uh, we didn't have a youth conference last year, but we're having one this year, I think so. So it's really exciting. It's really exciting what God's doing, especially amongst our youth. I had a word in, uh, in October last year that, uh, you know, there's a generation, if we don't reach them, we're going to lose them. Yeah. And it's key for us to be continually impacting the life of that age group. And, that, and I really talk about between the 12 and 12, 11 and 12 to the 18-year-old, you know, uh, really, really important. So our future is not dependent on our ability, but the one who is leading us into it. The Lord, He goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. That in Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. That's one of the prophetic words that came through one of the ministers. I think it was Graham Cook. Came through uh, Graham Cook. And so you can read that in the, in the book. There is still much to do and confidence has grown in both overseers and the church family to see our community impacted with the gospel. If God positions us, He positions us to impact our area where we are. Listen to me. Let me just say, can I, just everybody, forget the screen for a minute. Just look at me. Just look at me. Right in the early days, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't want to go into a place where there is a church like our church. I want to go where I can add to the churches. Are you getting this? And so when God brought us to Bristol to establish a Christian school and a Bible school, he said, because there was nothing of word and faith and spirit in Bristol. And we came to establish, not to take from other churches, but to empower other churches. You know, Hope City, most of their leadership have been through our Bible school. There are people that are sitting in Woodlands and other places that have been through our Bible school that are now functioning in the body of Christ. What have we done? We've come to add ourselves to the purposes and the plan of God to bring about His design. You've got to understand, we are unique to who we are. It's not an exclusive thing. We don't exclude ourselves from the greater body of Christ. But we come to impact and equip and be part of this city's success. When God gave me the word that, uh, uh, I think it was in 2002 or 2003, that Bristol will be known as the city of faith. I know they're calling it a city of hope. But let me tell you, God spoke to me about a city of faith. There's a big difference about hope and faith. Faith will bring the demonstration and the empowering and the miracle working power of God. Do you understand? It will revive the heart of the hearer. So it's really key that we understand. And so um, there are many needs in the ministry, and it's difficult to prioritize which is the more important one. So the list um, presented is simply the desire that the overseers hold for this coming year. So this is our desire for us to see. Let me tell you, it's pointless saving the world when our house is falling apart. So we've got to be focused on it's solidifying and consolidating what is in-house so that we can be effective outside the house. I nearly said outhouse, um, but that's like a toilet. But outside the house. Do you understand? Because listen to me, everything begins internally. If you don't catch this vision internally, it's going to produce nothing externally. And it's the same. If we don't catch this vision internally for this body and for what God requires of us, nothing's going to happen externally to impact and change people's hearts and lives. And so we would like to see our mortgage clear. And Pastor M is going to come and talk more about that at the end of the service. You know, we only have eight months left on our mortgage. I just want to commend the church. I would appreciate that. This building, we bought this building. They wanted a million pounds for this building. I put in, God told me, offer them 750,000. Amen? And when we came with that offer, 750,000, we took it on a lease to buy. 750,000, we only, they, everybody wanted a 20% deposit. We found one bank that was willing to give us, uh, this, lend us the, the mortgage for a 10% deposit. Now, I know that God says, oh, no man, anything but love. And I understand that. But, you know, at the time where we were as a congregation, we were small. And this was a faith project. Because it takes faith to believe God to pay the mortgage each month. We've never skipped. We've never lost a month. We've always been on time. And so, if you work the numbers, 10% of 750 leaves you 675,000. 
we, low, we owe only about 45 or 48,000 pounds left. Look what the Lord has done through his, his servants who have come and given sacrificially. Come on. Come on. Powerful. Powerful when you begin to think about it. And so it's key. And so the second thing is to upgrade our facility, which requires kind of urgent attention. Uh, this morning I heard again that Mr. Skinner was in one of the toilets fixing the toilets. Uh, so uh, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Uh, but sometimes toilets are not the greatest place to go and, and do it with all your might. Anyway, so... <laughs> So here's some of the things, and I mean that we have a whole business plan that we, we, we purposed and put together, and we were going to go and take a loan out from one of the banks. And you know what? The God, God just stopped us. We have the approval. It's been accepted. We can go and get the money. But is that best? The Bible says, oh, no man, anything but love. So we've not taken the loan. We said we're going to believe God. We're gonna, because if, if we take the loan, is that operating in faith or fear? Oh, that's not getting too much. Is that operating in faith or fear? And so we're going to trust God. And we believe that our breakthrough is coming. You know, I prophesy breaking barriers this year. Breaking barriers this year. So here's the things that we're going to look. Of course, clear the mortgage, building upgraders. We want to revamp our bookshop so that when people come through, those windows on that side will be open. We want to put sliding doors in, you know, those automatic doors, and they have a little coffee shop. So if people don't like Starbucks, they just might like the coffee bean. Amen. And, we, and we'll be cheaper than Starbucks. Anyway, don't say anything. So open it more to invite the community in because people are going to be passing. It will also give an indication of people wanting to bring their children to the early years. And so we want to put uh, fake grass down at the back so when the children play, there's a nice area for them to play. Yeah. Amen? And maybe create a, 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 an environment where the kids not only are safe, but that they can enjoy being here and being with them. Create, I call it create a child-friendly environment. Yeah, amen. amen. So we're also looking to improve the outward building because as you can see, all the nice buildings around us are all nicely clad. So it's one of, one of our desires to also upgrade our building externally and internally. This morning we came for showers of blessing upstairs. Uh, we discovered new leaks in our roof and those are important things that need to be done. I mean, we've been sitting in this, this building for, for years and I mean, we've been mending and patching. But you know what? God has now given us that asset. And so the mortgage that would normally have been spent on paying a mortgage, we can now utilize some of that towards upgrading our facility. You know, our heating and cooling is in a desperate situation. Toilet facilities outdated and need attention. Electronic doors for the bookshop and et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of things. And I'm sure that the overseers over the next few months will bring you the next every project that we want to do. This is your home. This is not... This is not Pastor Jerry's home. This is your home. Members of Carmel get to enjoy and appreciate. If you have an, an event and you want to use all A because you're a member of this church, you get the facility. You're able to utilize it. Hey Amen. Mm. Happy birthday. So uh, we also want to see growth in our early years, uh, which will contribute to our program, our enrollment program, or the feeder into our into, the pr into our school. Our Christian school promotes Christian education, which is being threatened by our secular society. And how are they trying to do us? They're requiring of us to remove the moral attributes or absolutes of God's word. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. They pulled three of our youngsters out and began to talk to them in our school. When they Ofsted came to visit us, began to talk to our children about same-sex relationships and how would they feel. And we said it's inappropriate it's inappropriate, inappropriate to talk to a youngster that not yet got a full understanding of their own sexuality about sexual matters way beyond their years. Why? Because that is how you control a nation. That is how you control the next generation, by dumbing down the moral absolutes of God and removing them. Are you with me? Our youth are looking to double in numbers, parents, this is vital for your spiritual well-being of your children. Your participation is necessary. We can only impact your children with what you impact them at home. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And let me tell you, we have an amazing youth. 
Why? Because we don't come and entertain the kids. We entertain the presence of God. That's vital. That's key for them. You know, one of the things that, that, one of the things that for, for many years, and, and why we're so strong on the youth, is that I grew up in a, in, a, in, a, in a Christian church. I was never challenged on salvation. I was never encouraged to be filled with the Spirit, Holy Spirit. I was never given an opportunity to encounter God. At the age of 16, I said, I am out of here. Until my life, 16 years later, 14 years later, hit a, hit a wall like, a, like you've never known. Hit a wall. I crashed. At the age of 30, I crashed. Totally crashed. And that's when I began to think, man, you know, is there something? I mean, I did third eye. I did the whole third eye thing. I did uh, Scientology. I was looking for every answer of every solution and never found any until I came back to the last thing which was the first thing that should have impacted my life. And I promised myself, never again, not with my children. I would drag them off to every revival meeting. You know, sometimes I find it amazing that when we have a God thing conference, the anointed ministers of God come and people go on holiday. Now, I don't, I don't dispute you shouldn't go on holiday, I believe. But you know what? If you know that that's going to make a difference in your child's life, is that the thing that you should be doing? So I dragged my kids out, oh, Daddy, it's holiday. I said, your best holiday is for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit and know that you have eternity settled in your heart. Each one of them, I watched them have an encounter with God. Okay, it's gone very quiet now. Amen. It's gone very, very quiet now. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Amen. Say, preach it, Pastor. Especially the other to use that have teenagers and children. Say, preach it, Pastor. Preach it. Uh. So, our weekend Bible college is a hidden gem and needs to be set in public view. You know what? I believe that with all my heart. You know what? We need to begin. Where are we now? Oh, it hasn't come up. So, our weekend Bible school, listen to me, it changed my life. If I didn't believe in it, we wouldn't promote it. You can ask the overseers, each all of them, the pastors of the church who have been through Bible school. Did it change your life? Yes. For good or for bad? Good. All those that have done Bible school, did it change your life? Yes. For good or for bad? Good. So why don't you go and tell somebody who has not been through Bible school, listen, get off your tush. Better still, why don't you say, I will pay the first semester for you. I will invest in you. I'll pay the first semester. Just go and sit there and see what a difference it's going to make in your life. Let me tell you, uh, I had one of my guys. He's been in, he, he said he's, he was born into the church. He's now 70. He's born into the church. I started teaching on our basic foundations, our fundamental foundations of faith. You know what he turned around and said to me? I don't know where I've been living for the past 50 years. For the first time in my life, my eyes of my understanding have been opened and I've realized how the enemy has robbed me because I didn't understand the principles of God and how to employ them in my life. Just the basic foundations. If you can get through the basic foundations, let me tell you, it will stir a hunger in you for more of the Word of God. Amen. 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 So where are we now? Are we up to Petra? Petra is going, to, is going to go with your help door to door to invite people in our area to church. It is our responsibility to knock on doors, give people a card and say, I want to invite you for church. But in the case you need any prayer, I can pray for you now. Listen, people don't just happen to come until there is a need. Do you understand? But you can create a desire by going to them. Why do you think Starbucks advertises? Why do you think everybody advertises? Because they're creating an, a, a desire in you to have a need fulfilled. Our advertising is you. The best message of salvation is when Christians go out, take a card, knock on a door, give it to somebody in the house and say, we want to invite you to church, and if you have any needs, I'd like to pray for you. Simple. If they say, I'm not interested, you say, thank you very much for taking the time. Please give this to somebody that you think may be interested, and off you go. Now, that, that, that met with a real big amen. Did you hear that, Pastor Michael? <laughs> Pastor Asif, did you hear the big amen on that one? Let me, let, me, let me just say this to you. How many of you know Pastor Mark Anker? 
Pastor Mark Hankins. So we, there's a little church in Alexandria. It's not a little church, it's a big church now in Alexandria. He handed it over to his son, Aaron. Aaron is doing the most amazing thing. You know, when their father was there, they probably had about, what was it, about 1,000 people, 800 to 1,000 people attending church on the Sunday, every Sunday. He committed to knock on every door in his town with his youth group and with the people in the church. You know that they've doubled in size in a matter of five years. Uh, uh. They've doubled in size in a matter of over 2,000 people now attend that church through Aaron. Why? Not because he's such a great minister and not because Pastor Hankin was such a great minister. Because the community looked at the church and said, this church cares for us. That they would get out of their pews on a Sunday morning and knock on a door and tell me about Jesus. Are you with me? Amen. Amen. Well, that, that went down like I, excellent, wonderful. Listen, I've done them all. I've knocked on the doors. Even now in Houston, I've gone on the streets. I stood in, in the middle of, of uh, in, in Bristol playing my guitar, singing in tongues uh, while people handed out tracks. So don't tell me, well, partner, why don't you do I've done it all, and I'm still doing it, by the way. You know, if a toilet needs fixing, Houston, yours truly. If a garden needs mowing, yours truly. Uh, you know, if trees need to be cut, yours truly. If a bulb needs to be changed, yours truly. And my worship leader, you're looking at him. Anyway, moving right along. I looked at the band this morning, and I'm thinking, you know, there he's sitting out there. Nathan is sitting out there having a Sunday off. I thought I would love to have a Sunday off. Well done, Nathan. He's replicated himself. Wasn't the team just awesome this morning? They were brilliant. Come on. Come on. Anyway. So our media is looking for volunteers to help in every area of audio, visual presentation. And also, you know, listen, if you have skills of media and you've got some time and you can help us, you know, our website and anything else that needs revamping, we could use your skill. We're desperate for your skill. You know, this morning I just, I was so blessed. How many of you saw that nine-year-old, ten-year-old kid on the camera? Let me tell you, people, listen to me. These youngsters have built a career. I mean, if I think of Chris Jr., he came here as a 13-year-old. It was 12. It could have been even 12. 12. We needed a drummer, and he started playing drums. He's now in university learning all about drumming and production and everything else. Through his serving in his church, God gave him a career. Isn't that awesome? So come on now. You know, if you have any kind of skill in that you can apply, then please come and fill one of the forms in that we'll give you at the end. The Hamper Project wants to explore possible outreach in East as well. It's one of our desires. Why? That's the momentum. We're creating a momentum. What's the momentum? The awareness of Jesus Christ and what He has done for humanity. Amen. That's the momentum. It's not to grow a, a big church, but it's to grow big in the influence of Christ in our community. Number 10, we are reinstating all our courses from Family Transformation, Promise of Purity, and Recovery Programs. And it's all, you know, divorce recovery, you know, um, uh, married, death recovery, all those kind of things. Why? Because it's important. That's what we do. That's our equipping. People have come forward and said, I want to be involved in that. If you see something like that and, and it touched your life, come and volunteer your time. Give of your time to help others step into that. Number 11, we desire to increase our households into every area of Bristol, this is Pastor Mix, very much on Pastor Michael's heart, is to see every area or every suburb in Bristol have a household of, household of faith. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And that's possible. All you've got to do is make your house available. Zacchaeus made his house available to Jesus, changed everything for everybody. Amen? You say, well, you know, my house is very small. Listen, it doesn't matter how small or how big it is. Well, you know, my kids mess it up. Who cares? Listen, just open the doors, allow people to come in. Yeah. Everyone's got a messy home. Yeah. I mean, there are some exceptions, but most people have messy homes. Anyway, moving right on. We want to increase our mentoring, especially in our young lions. So if you're of the age of 16 to 20, and you would like to be involved in the young lions becoming mentored, in a young line, please, you know, come and see Pastor Mick, he, you know, Pastor Michael, or Pastor Daryl, you know, they're keen to, well, I don't know about Pastor Daryl. Anyway, Pastor Michael, 
And Pastor Daryl, keen to invest in young men's life. Because that's the future of the leadership of our nation, of our church, of business, of industry. And of course, you know, uh, you, you, you know they, they got something for the young ladies too. Amen. Amen. And, uh, I don't know what you call them. You call them roses or what do you call them? Okay, <laughs> young roses. So uh, volunteer our time to be taught, mentored, and equipped to serve faithfully in our church and community. To become missional minded and explore the opportunities that God makes available to us. So God wants to give us these opportunities to make us available to the things and the plans that He has for us. This is what creates the momentum that God has. And so uh, really important, how do we get involved? And people say, how can I get involved? Well, right in the middle of this momentum book sh booklet, which you're going to be handed out now. So the ushers and hostesses are ready to hand them out now. Um, I want you to just in the middle, there's a little file like this. You just got to tear it out. And then the rest of the, you can read the rest of what is in the book and then begin to fill it in. And it's got all the different areas of where you can come to volunteer. Maybe you're new to the church. Maybe you want to put your name and, and down because you, you really want to, you know. And then, of course, there's courses that, that if you haven't completed them, Living in Christ, Crown Finances, Promise of Purity, Position for Blessing, you, you just leave them blank. And then we know that the possibility that you might like to attend those. And pull that out and fill it in and hand it into the ashes. And, uh, and then you can take this home and go and read it. How many of you promise to read it? Oh, my word. We're in trouble, Mish. How many of you promise to read it? Please know what's going on in your church. This is your church. Amen? This is your church. Okay, last file. So faith is a journey and eternity is the destination. Together we can see His kingdom come and His will be done. So together we can enjoy the journey. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. Praise God. I, just, uh, we're just going to wait for you to get one of these things. It's really key. And just by the way, when you read through this, and especially read through the aspects of what God is saying prophetically, because it's important that you understand what God's saying prophetically. And for the prayer team and the intercessors, this then becomes the instrument of your prayers, of how we pray for our church, how we pray for the nation, how we pray for our leaders. And then you will also see that I've got some points there. Everything must begin in prayer. The desire to see manifestation of, power, of God's presence, to break free from our comfort zone, uh, to intensify our expectation of God. And um, we must always remember Carmel is always about people. God is in the people business. How we reach them, equip them, enable them to experience Jesus like never before. We love to accommodate, embrace, and encourage people from every nation. We are not based, biased or prejudiced, nor do we reject anyone based upon their social standing, background, or past. Our mission is to reach people from the four corners of the world, starting with our home city. In Luke 9, 2, he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick.